All right, so the recording started. Hello and uh, welcome to the annual seminar organized jointly by the uh, FACS, Formal Aspects of Computing Science Interest Group and the Computer Science Committee of the London Mathematical Society. Um, my name is Andrei Popescu. I'm the liaison between these two groups. Um, and uh, in the list of panelists, I will be shortly, shortly be joined by, by Professor Jonathan Bowen too, chair of FACS. And we also have uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kieran O'Connor, uh, LMS uh, event organizer. I have a very pleasant job today. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Larry Paulson. Let me say a few words about, uh, about our speaker. Larry is a fellow of the Royal Society and a professor of computational logic at the University of Cambridge, a fellow of uh, Clare College. Uh, he has made fundamental contributions to the science and art of theorem proving and functional programming, including pedagogically as the author of the textbook ML for the Working Programmer, which many of us uh, grew up with. After being involved in work on the LCAF family of provers, based on, on uh, the ideas of Dana Scott and Robin Milner, and created the so-called Cambridge LCF, the Cambridge variant of uh, LCF, in 1996, Larry created the generic interactive theorem prover Isabel. He has been developing Isabel ever since, together with uh, Tobias Nipkov, Makarios Wenzel, and several students and postdocs. Today, Isabel, mostly through its Isabel Hall object logic, is one of the most widely used theorem provers and really one of the most widely used formal method tools in computer science and mathematics, if you count the time of, of uh, interaction. Larry has opened or co-opened so many important directions in the field of theorem proving. I'm going to just mention a few. Um, Resolution-based high-order proof management, the cooperation between interactive and automatic provers, leading to Isabel's sledgehammer tool and other hammers it inspired, uh, the semantic approach to the mechanization of inductive and co-inductive definitions, and the inductive method for certifying cryptographic proofs, uh, protocols. Uh, as a perhaps not so widely acknowledged contribution, not even by Larry himself, his generic Isabel theorem prover with its technique for representing object logics was one of the first successful incarnations of higher order abstract syntax developed at about the same time as systems such as Edim Edinburgh LF. Uh, Larry also formalized deep results in set theory and logic, including the logician's favorite, the first ever mechanized proof of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, an impressive technical achievement uh, providing what is, in my opinion, the only acceptable way to confirm this landmark result, uh, taming, so to speak, the devil from the extremely elaborate details. I think Gödel himself and uh, also René Descartes' guardian of truth via clarity would have highly valued this work. Recently, Larry has developed the Metitarsky prover specialized on real value functions, encompassing uh, wisdom from the practice of working mathematicians. In fact, through his recent advanced ERC grant, Alexandria, Larry, together with his team, was able to pursue in a very focused manner what I would say was his long-standing commitment, making theorem provers capable of tackling state-of-the-art contemporary mathematics and turning them into tools that will eventually support the day-by-day -day creation of, of mathematics, of mathematicians. Um, just to conclude with a short personal statement, if I were to select uh, someone to represent the Earth at the 2024 Galactic Theorem Proving Conference, my selection would be Larry. Uh, but for now, this evening, let's enjoy Larry's presence on Earth with us as he tells us about the challenges and promises of theorem proving technology for the 21st century mathematics. Just to say that we'll aim at a one hour talk after which we can have questions uh, for the following 15 minutes or so. Um, so uh, the event will, just another thing to mention, the event will be recorded and made available on YouTube and uh, uh, all of you will receive the link. So Larry, uh, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Andre, for that introduction. Okay, so formalizing 21st century mathematics. So why that exactly? It's been a dream of people for many decades, in fact, the idea of formalizing mathematics by computer. And like most such dreams, it seemed like it would never be actually realized. It would be something like nuclear fusion, except I think no one ever said the formalization of mathematics was even going to be 10 years away to be infinitely postponed. It just seemed in the remote future. And yet, 
it's happening right now. So things like this capset problem um, and other things, liquid tensor experiment, very interesting, um, very complex and very new developments, things from um, that have been uploaded to archive, say, and in some cases checked formally before checked by the actual referees. So it is actually happening that the, the dream, this is not like nuclear fusion because it is actually happening now. Um, why do we do this? Well, I always show this slide. I wish I could remember where I got this from, this bottom of page 118 of the, X, the axiom of choice, where we have five footnotes describing um, five errors. And, you know, when I do this, I am not trying to mock mathematicians. Rather, I'm appreciating that mathematics is incredibly complicated, especially today. Um, this is not like, say, Cantor's theorem, which although a very deep result has a very simple proof, or say the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, again, a very important result, has really a very simple proof. We don't live in those times anymore. So things are incredibly complicated and software can help. So just to be clear, now many of you perhaps know what a proof assistant is already, but if not, I should say something. So it's a software system providing, for one thing, some kind of formal language in which you write mathematics. So you can define structures, you can define functions, and you can make assertions about them. And you also need a language in which proofs are going to be expressed. Now, at the very bottom, there's going to be some formal calculus something analogous to first order logic, but usually first order logic is regarded as too weak, but some formal calculus, and we really are going to be reducing mathematics all the way down to that level. Um, you will normally not actually work at such a low level because your proofs would never be finished. So you need some kind of powerful automation where you can give higher level commands like simplify this or <clears throat> run a theorem proving procedure that will prove simple consequences of things. And one such command that might replace hundreds or thousands of low level inferences. And so there will be a language provided to you in which you can write these proofs or these proof generating directives, we could say. Of course, you need a nice user interface that you work through this to help you manage your big development. And to do mathematics today, of course, there'll be huge amounts of background material in the form of libraries, which should be made available. Uh, it's worth mentioning, perhaps, that this sort of software was originally developed for the purpose of verifying software or computer systems and the application to mathematics came later. Um, now, there are two main kinds of formalisms used. Um, what I am talking about mostly is higher order logic, also known as simple type theory. It's a very simple, weak formalism. Um, and what it has come out, very, in very interesting result over the last few years is that such a weak formalism seems to be expressible enough for almost everything that we recognize as mathematics. And because of its simplicity, getting good automation is relatively straightforward. There are stronger formalisms that come under the heading of dependent type theories of various kinds, most of them based on the Uekokong calculus of constructions. This system, although it does not look at all like axiomatic set theory, turns out to be slightly stronger than ZF. Um, and it's the basis of lean, for it, which is the thing in which many, many things are being done at the moment. 
um, and also Koch, Agda, and some other tools. Um, now, some will say that in formalizing mathematics, we are sucking the soul out of it because we're evil or something. But this is not the case. Why do we formalize mathematics? Well, the thing is, it's mathematicians have always been doing this. So when Euclid unified numerous schools of Greek geometry within a single system, that was a formalization of it, not formalization as we regard it now, but putting it under this uniform set of axioms is part of the same project. When Cauchy and Weierstrass removed the infinitesimals from analysis of putting that on a rigorous basis, they had good reasons for doing this because infinitesimals were not well understood and they were regarded as not particularly rigorous. Then you look at people like Cantor, who was still seen as an antichrist by some, it seems, and yet he was working on real problems, and real problems in, I think, topology or something. So these guys were trying to understand the nature of numbers, and the nature of infinity, and these were necessary for specific mathematical problems that they were working on. And then finally, when, with the discovery of paradoxes around the turn of the 20th century, we started to see more use of what we would see as foundational projects, Whitehead and Russell, and then De Bruyne and Trubelec, both of them mathematicians who saw these, the possibilities of formalizing things by computer. And of course, I, I, for some reason, regard De Bruyne as a mathematician's mathematician, someone who did a lot of real mathematics in a lot of different fields and very down to earth about that, but also was a pioneer of doing things by computer. And I think it is now clear that essentially all mathematics is formalizable, but if we get back to De Bruyne again, this quote of his comes from the very first paper on automath. We do not have a definition of the word mathematics. And I think he's right. He continued, very often a, mathematic, a mathematician will see things through, okay, what De Bruyne calls using a meta language, or what I might say, perhaps he simply has an insight We've all experienced this. You see a thing that is clearly true, even though there is no obvious proof. In fact, it becomes difficult to say, what do you mean when you want to prove a thing that is obvious to us? And yet sometimes when you try and reduce it to a particular calculus, you find it becomes very tricky. And this, I think, still is the one biggest obstacle to the formalization of mathematics. So we have to give De Bruyne credit for identifying this problem at such an early stage. Okay, now, although many of the examples I've given you were formalized using lean, I'm here to tell you about Isabel Hall. And if you don't like that, you should complain to Andre for inviting me in the first place. So the, the European Research Council very kindly gave me a bunch of money to investigate this, and I thought I should tell you a bit about what happened there. As it says, their aim was to support real mathematicians, professional mathematicians using the tools we had and by developing further tools, and to examine the questions in red. How, how far can we go, you could say, were the key questions. What areas can we formalize? Are there any things that are off limits? What kinds of proofs can we formalize? Are there certain things that, again, are somehow too difficult? And in this project, we hired mathematicians. And I think one of them had prior experience with Koch. The other had no prior experience at all with any such tool. 
Now, I should mention we had a lot of mathematics in Isabel already. Um, and I have, I had a slide, actually my, this is based on a slide that filled the entire slide. I don't want to bore people with so many. The thing is, there's a variety of different things here, like matrix theory is very different from measure theory, again, quite different from complex analysis and so on. So we already had a wide range of mathematics and you might say, well, the point was already proved in 2017. But there were some criticisms. Now this came, I would say, very trenchant criticism from Kevin Buzzard, who rather cruelly said 19th century mathematics. Now, not all of this is 19th century, but the point was, in his view, none of the stuff people were doing could really be called in any way recent or in any way representative of what mathematicians were doing now. So we had to really try and go for recent and difficult work within our capabilities, of course, and for my own capabilities, I have to say, I do have a mathematics degree, but I learned very little apart from combinatorics and logic, so I'm not really very well equipped personally to, to do this stuff. So we got our money, we got our people, and we started. So I'll give you a, a little bit of history here. So, and we formalized some of these papers, a bit of projective geometry, some of the theory of quantum computing. And here, so uh, one of my postdocs, Anthony Borg, found two errors in a heavily cited game on quantum computing. It's a, a sorry, a heavily cited paper a paper entitled Quantum Games and Quantum Strategies, um, and which actually resulted in the authors publishing an erratum. And then there's, so anyway, we formalize a lot of still, I think, relatively elementary material here, but we were going to continue on. So this was again an early project using, um, with the help of a couple of interns. I think they were from Ecole Polytechnique. And uh, so this is a well-known fact that every field admits an algebraically closed extension of which an example of this is the fact that we can extend the field of the real numbers to obtain the field of the complex numbers, which is algebraically closed. In that case, by adding the root of just one polynomial x squared plus one. So in general, you need to consider a series of field extensions. Um, so it seems like a non-trivial proof. And the two, the two um, interns managed to find a construction using Zorn's on Well, they used, clearly they used an existing proof, but they managed to squeeze it into our formalism. I was very, I was not at all confident in 2019 that this kind of series of field extensions was a thing that could be formalized in Isabel, far less that it could be done by a couple of students. And this was the very first time this result had been formalized anywhere. Um, now, couple of years later, experimental mathematics produced a special issue devoted entirely to the formalization of mathematics. Uh, and I was very happy to see that we took up half of it. So what did we publish? One paper included formalizations of two, two papers on basically infinite series and irrationality. Another of our papers was on ordinal partition theory. So this is basically infinitary combinatorics, basically infinite generalizations of Ramsey's theorem to, to transfinite ordinals. Um, also, we formalized Grothendieck schemes, mainly because Kevin Buzzard said that we couldn't. And we were, apparently, we did this in less time than they did it, and we didn't copy them either. Now, I'm afraid I can't tell you very much about the Grothendieck formalization, because although I did take part, 
I can't say I understood much of what I was doing. I still have no idea what a scheme is. So we took up half the special issue and, and that certainly seemed like a bit of an achievement. So continuing the historical progression through this project, um, we tackled some harder material. Now these are relatively recent things. I think additive combinatorics is still regarded as a hot topic. Things are continuing to be published. Combinatorial designs is earlier stuff, but also important. Um, we did a bit, this, this was a formalization of a book by Apostle on modular forms. And again, strict omega categories. This is just a selection of the things we did. We were trying at this stage, uh, having done what we thought was relatively easy things with not too much difficulty to try these harder things. So I should just mention some of these. So what is Shemaretti's regularity lemma? It's, well, he's concerned with extremely large graphs. And the point of it is it turns out his result has lots of other implications for number theory. The statement of it is not too complicated. So you need this notion of an epsilon regular partition, which is a technical definition on behavior of, gra of graphs. And it says that for every epsilon, there exists an M with a particular property. It turns out once you have the right definitions, the proof is actually not even that difficult. And as I recall, our main difficulty was really our own fault because there were things we didn't quite understand in the lecture notes that we were using and we were a little too stubborn to ask people to help us to say, what do you exactly mean here? So I think we wasted a month or two. Um, even so, the project only took a few months, I think, to get this formalized, um, followed by one of its consequences. This Roth theorem on arithmetic progressions says that if you have, in effect, a sufficiently large set of integers, then it must contain an arithmetic progression by which I mean here something like um, five, seven, nine, where you have, you know, a progression of numbers separated by the same amount, but just of length three, five, 10, 15, that kind of thing. <laughs> Excuse me. Under additive combinatorics, this again is a very important field, and here I've stolen my student slide. Additive combinatorics is concerned with these so-called sum sets. So here you've got an abelian group, and it's a group we write with additive notation with a plus sign and zero. And you imagine you're given two sets and you want to consider all possible ways of adding it together an element from each set. And you call that the sum set A plus B. And then you maybe will iterate this to have N copies of A added together. And for some reason, this is hot at the moment. So we proved some of these. Now minus is kind of has the obvious definition Um, this is talking about the cardinality of Na, and it turns out that for sufficiently large N, the cardinality is exactly a polynomial. Now, me being a computer science, I thought it said bounded by a polynomial, which would be a lot easier, but in fact, it is exactly a polynomial. These and those... These are all apparently quite deep and relatively recent and important results. So you see, we have been able to, to, to uh, prove these advanced results. I was certainly happy about that. Continuing, uh, my student, Chelsea Edmund, who was facing her viva very soon, focused on thing in combinatorics known as block designs and many related combinatorial structures. So in a sense, the whole contents of a trad traditional book on combinatorics 
would be covered by the sort of structures that she um, formalized in a kind of very elaborate and systematic way so that you can have all kinds, there are many, many weird and wonderful combinations of constraints you can put on block designs that, that people will study. Um, she also studied generating function methods and more interesting still, probabilistic proof methods. So you will often find in combinatorics that you will prove the existence of a thing in a non-constructive way by intuitively you say, well, imagine coloring the edges red and blue, and then you say the probability of such and such a thing is greater than zero. And if the probability is greater than zero, then that tells you that something exists because if, if it did not exist, of course, the probability of it happening would be zero. So you have a non-constructive proof doing often a quite simple sounding, intuitive sounding argument in terms of probability. And then you ask, well, how in God's name can one formalize that? And it turns out if you just set up a probability space, you're there. Then it turns out really it's the counting argument, which is in disguise and put in a more natural form. So, and by the way, Chelsea organized all this using a thing in Isabel called locales. I can't get into much detail about what a locale is, but I should say locales are not part of any formal calculus. They are rather a function provided by this, the theorem prover itself, allowing you to manage contexts so that you can put in, let's say, a series of definitions of things that you will use in a number of places. So you can just bundle them up and then uh, invoke them when you need them and get kind of for free all the associated theorems proved about them. Okay, now I'd like to show you some of the things that we actually looked at here as the actual source material. So this was a paper published in 2002. I have my title in mind, right? 21st century mathematics. So we are barely, but we are definitely in the 21st century. This, I think, don't remember the exact year. Uh, it's the 60s, I believe. Um, As I said earlier, ordinal partition theory is a generalization of Ramsey's theorem in set theory. It is very abstruse stuff. In fact, it is so abstruse that this paper, which was five pages long, had basically the entire main theorem, the entire proof was incorrect, and they had to publish an, um, a full page of corrections a couple of years later. This again reminds us how difficult the problem is when you get, you know, very smart people making lots of errors. Um, and that's why these very detailed constructions do need to be checked if we can. Then there's this, this is the same field. In fact, I formalized the previous paper because Larson was referring to it. Um, referring to it in this paper here. Now she was, I think, a bit more careful because her much longer paper had no significant errors that I could find. Now this by Tim Gowers, this is only lecture notes. It's not a research paper, but there's a lot of difficult stuff in here. And finally this now, so this, paper on Diagonal Ramsey reached Archive in March, and a Cambridge student named Bravik Mehta decided to formalize it using lean, and he got there, so he finished the task before the referees uh, gave their verdict on this paper. So that's a great achievement. Now, again, keeping the title of my talk in mind, 21st Century Mathematics, I thought I would try it too, um, 
I was cheating because I knew Bravik had done it already and he'd put all his proofs online. So if I got stuck, which I very frequently did, I could see how he did it and try and get some ideas from there. Now, I did not get as far as he did, but I did manage to do um, uh, the first five sections of the paper, which include a couple of fiendishly tricky proofs. So I can certainly say that I have formalized a bit of 21st century mathematics myself. And looking at this, it is, as I said, very, very complicated. They are just a lot of very detailed construction of an algorithm operating on certain things with all kinds of constraints. Um, and you do have to wonder how even with four authors, they could be confident in their result without its being checked by machine. So we are moving to an era where authors will be able to do this and do it themselves. I should summarize, again, I'm talking about this big grant and they gave us all this money. Thank you, ERC. What did we accomplish? Well, we showed that we could work without borders. Somewhat to my surprise, nothing seemed off limits to us. We had good performance. I'm a computer scientist, so importance is, performance is important to me. We achieved pretty good automation as well. So a lot of these proofs are at a high level. We tackled really some sophisticated results and we got some decent looking proofs of them. Now I want to say a little more about some of these points. So when I say no borders between topics, so this is the, the root file of one of our developments, this is not even finished yet. So the modular function development is incorporating all of these things. I don't even know what half of them are. Something about binding numbers, Dirichlet series, Landau symbols, and so on. Bring them all in and they work, they work happily together. And this is a necessity because mathematics is like this, that you bring in probability spaces and therefore the big measures when you're talking about graphs. So this, this has to work. And we got it to work. There was also a very interesting example combining transfinite recursion with holomorphic functions. Oh, and we didn't need dependent types and we were able to handle all kinds of very complex constructions. And by the way, again, the computer scientist here talking, it ran it runs pretty fast. Um, so, for example, for Shemaretti's regularity lemma, which is a significant result with a non-trivial proof, and it runs in 14 seconds, and that's on a fairly elderly machine as well. So we are certainly not having any problems with performance here. And incidentally, we can have proofs that are thousands of lines long, and we do not have to chop them into lots of little pieces like they do in some systems. And I think it makes for much more legible proofs. I will go into that a bit more later. Now, I do get a certain pushback. So here's the kind of thing I hear all the time. And if for this, you never prove anything hard. I want to say for crying out loud, guys, um, you know, these, these are serious people whose work we have been formalizing. Of course, there are harder things. There are things that we haven't covered, but we have covered a lot of really deep stuff. Well, as for needing dependent types, I did expect this. I'll be quite honest with you. I thought there would be a, a lot of no-go areas. We just never found any. And in particular, you see the way dependent types work in most formalisms I'm aware of, they have intentional equality, which means if you have type uh, indexed type T, you do not get to infer that ti is the same type as tj just because i equals j because i and j have to be 
definitionally equal. And definitionally equal means they, that one can be calculated from the other in a particular way, depending on the precise form of the definition. To my mind, it certainly goes against everything I learned, even from my mathematics training, that if you define a thing, the details of the definition should not matter. All that should matter are the properties that you derive from it. Um, but here you find yourself in a situation where the exact form in which the definition is expressed is a commitment that you can never, ever escape. So that is not a thing I would like. I get this. Um, as for the proofs being nicer, um, let me just talk about legibility of proofs. See, so I'm quoting, I think, Andrew Granville. I'm not sure if he's done lean, lean proofs himself, but he is a mathematician. And he has a very good point. Um, if someone types a lot of stuff into a computer and says, this is a theorem, why should you believe them? Now, those of you living in the UK and not living under a rock will have heard of the Horizon scandal, a thing involving the UK post office and the prosecution of hundreds of postmasters for allegedly stealing from their post offices. The evidence that they had stolen huge amounts of money came from a computer and the claim made by the post office was the computer is always right and therefore these guys had stolen all this money even though there was no evidence of the money anywhere, no fancy cars, no expensive holidays. Um, so we know now, I think, that you cannot simply trust a computer. And that is why you need a proof, turning back to our own subject, a proof you can read yourself. So if you look at this, this is a, obviously a trivial fact that tells you that if you are summing up a particular function over two different ranges and you subtract one from the other, then you can express the result as a single summation as shown on the left side here. Now, if you look at the proof, of course, it's code, and we need to accept our formal proofs are code. And nevertheless, you can see something here. Some kind of assertion is being proved. This says for every i less than or equal to n minus m, there exists a k such that something. This next line is about the identity of two sets. This is basically 0 up to n minus m. That is m up to n. And this funny thing here is the function to subtract n. And that is the image operation. So <clears throat> altogether, that says if you take the interval from m to n and subtract n from every element, then you get the interval from 0 to n minus m, and so on. So line by line, you can read them. So this subtraction of n is an injective function. Therefore, I can change the index variable in the summation. Then I can do something else. The result follows. So you have a thing. OK, I'm not pretending this is super easy to read, but it's not impossible either. Certainly, if you are querying the result for some reason, you have the ability to check it. Now, for my next example, I need uh, to mention what Ramsey's theorem is, in case anyone hasn't heard of it, there is a statement of it right there. It's a statement of a very simple form of Ramsey's theorem, that if you have two integers, m and n, then there exists some number r, m, n. Every graph that is at least that large will contain a clique of size m or an anticlique of size n. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's an example, at least. Here I have six, it's often called a party problem. So these six dots would represent people at a party. The red lines are the edges, and these are the people who know each other. Now here, almost everybody knows everybody else at this party. And yet, 
there are three people who do not know each other. So these are the dotted lines in blue are the people who do not know each other. So this is an anti-clique or an independent set. So for the case of three and three, that is R of three and three happens to be six. So if you have six people at your party, they will definitely be either three people, each of who know each other or three people who do not. And this result generalizes in fact to every M and N in fact, you can even generalize it to higher dimensions and so on. You get a very powerful theory, but I mean, that's for another time. So that's Ramsey's theorem. Now, here's an example. Here we are proving that the Ramsey number of m plus n, sorry, m plus one and n plus one is greater than m times n. To prove it, all we need is one counterexample. I need just one graph that does not have the requis requisite clique or anti-clique, and this will be proved. So how do we do it? Um, there's a fairly obvious graph that we can use. What we're going to do, the vertices of this graph will be pairs of integers, x, y, and we will put an edge between every two um, vertices where the second component is the same. So here's a picture. Now I do need to clarify, there are edges not just between the ones as connected as shown on the slide, but edges between all pairs of vertices on the same level. So if you accept that, then you see that the cliques, if you like, the largest cliques are the red things you see on the slide. And you can see if, that if the width of this thing is M, there clearly cannot be a clique of size M plus one, because it's just not there. As for the anti-cliques or the independent sets, because all the things, all the vertices on any particular horizontal line are connected. An anti-clique must go up at every stage. And so equally an anti-clique is limited by the, the vertical height of this thing. And so there will be no anti-clique of size n plus one. Now you could argue that having presented this picture, the theorem is proved. And in fact, if you were to see this in a mathematics textbook, that is all they would do. They would say, the following graph satisfies the claim QED. Sadly, it doesn't work like that if you're formalizing mathematics, and so here we are. There is the proof. Now, remember this section is about legible proofs. So I am trying to claim to you that this is legible. Now, you may not agree with me, but I would say, first of all, um, you can see something of the structure of the proof. You can see here the definition of the edges of the graph. As I said, you've got pairs of x, y, and x prime y, where the second components are the same. You see x and x prime are both less than m, y less than n. Um, so we are proving a negative. So we're proving that the given number is not a Ramsey number. So we, in the course of the proof, we assume that in fact the claim, we assume the negation of the claim holding. This tells us then that there is a clique or anti-clique, um, which is K. Then you consider the two cases, either it's a clique or it's a, an anti-clique that is an independent set. And then for each one, each of the two cases, you do a bit of a calculation to obtain the result. So, okay, it's not something you're going to treat as bedtime reading. Nevertheless, it is legible to, it is a thing that you could check with your eyeballs alone without a computer. Okay, third example. 
Um, Dirichlet's approximation theorem is a relatively elementary result. It's about approximating a real number <clears throat> to a given accuracy by a rational number of by a rational number with a relatively small numerator and denominator. The proof is basically by the pigeonhole principle. So you take the fractional part of your real number, you generate n plus one real numbers, and you stuff them into the unit interval, which you have divided into only n parts. So by the pigeonhole principle, um, one of the, there is one of those sub intervals will contain two of these points. You do some calculations, and the result follows. So here you have a proof. As I say, of course, it's an elementary proof, but it's not a trivial proof. And here is what it looks like. That's half of it. So I'm not lying to you. This is the first half. You can see, for example, there we're declaring a function generating the n plus one um, fractional parts. And this is this line y is the n sub intervals of the unit interval. Here we are looking for a contradiction under from the claim that there are no clashes. <clears throat> Then here we are working out the pigeonhole principle, basically. And that is the entire rest of the proof. So a thing which in a textbook took about two thirds of a page is this much formal material. So it's not too bad. And you can read things. You can say here at this point, we've obtained X and X prime with the following properties and so on. Okay, why am I making such a big deal about this? Well, if you can read your proof, I mean, it's not enough to say true. You want to know why it's true. You want to know maybe there are relationships between the proof of this result and the proof of some other result. Uh, speaking as a computer scientist, it's nice to be able to grab things from one proof and stick it in another proof or to look at the proof and say, actually, this construction is a general one. I can remove it and I can turn it, make it into a dilemma, or I can maybe make a definition, even make a small theory of something that is useful for proving things of that sort. But to do any of those things, you need to be able to actually eyeball your proof. And as I said earlier, if you don't trust computers and you don't trust software, and you shouldn't really, you can read them. Um, as an aside, I trust the proofs from the computer because they are fiendishly hard to get them out, to get them going, to get them working. Right, so what can we deduce? And I'm going to give you some of my favorite quotes. So Hating was one of the founders of the school of the philosophy of mathematics called intuitionism. Um, so constructive mathematics. So for him, mathematics consists of mental constructions. And he says, of course, it's impossible to set up a system of formulas for mathematics because the possibilities of thought cannot be reduced to a finite number of rules set up in advance. You can't disagree with that, actually, although he said intuitionistic mathematics. But and we have Gödel. Gödel's views on the philosophy of mathematics were absolutely antithetical to Hating's. And that he said, it is impossible to formalize all of mathematics in a single formal system, as the intuitionists have told us all along. But here is the funny thing. Certainly, from my six years of experience using higher order logic, it was fine for almost everything. Now, a, a little remark about what we call proof theoretic strength. So set theory is a very, very big world. Um, that is the Milo Frankel set theory. It's just a colossal uh, universe of stuff in which you can do mathematics. 
Now, what is called Zermilo set theory without the Frankel is a much, is a very small fragment of that. And higher order logic is even smaller. So it is surprising that almost everything that we looked at seemed to fit very easily in higher order logic. Now, for some of the things, like the things working with transfinite ordinals and transfinite recursion, they do need ZF set theory. And luckily, in Isabel Hall, we have as a library that you can uh, import, a library that includes the ZF axioms and allows us then to have a whole copy of ZF at our disposal when we need it. And it's all nicely integrated with higher order logic so that we don't have to construct things like the real numbers all over again. So it turns out then, Whitehead and Russell, way back in like 1910, when they set up their, what they called their system of ramified types, their, their system of logic, which eventually gave us most of the formalisms we use today, their system already was essentially powerful enough to formalize almost all mathematics as it is done. Even very elaborate things like schemes do not go very high in this set theoretic hierarchy. So we found that if we just tackled a thing and kept going, we could get our proofs done. But I will admit, a mathematicians find these things hard to use, and they are, are hard to use. Um, and by the way, I don't think it's because they are badly designed or, or anything of that sort. It's because we're doing dealing with really difficult things. Um, so getting back to the questions that we tried to answer, certainly everything we looked at, we were able to formalize. As for the proofs, um, what constantly threw us off were errors, um, and especially gaps, ambiguities, uh, and many, many, many of the papers we look at have, have ambiguities here and there, which if you don't ask the author, you could waste an awful lot of time trying to figure it out. Now, there is one quirk of Isabel Hall. It may matter to some people. The axiom of choice is built in at a fairly early stage in the development of Isabel Hall. So if you are an ac phobe you will have a problem. Right. What are the remaining obstacles to the formalization of mathematics? Well, one is how much there is. For all the library development we've done, that is still only scratching the surface of what is there. Then you have to organize them. And then you get a problem because different people formalize things in different ways and they're not always compatible. Finding things, finding things is hard for a bunch of reasons, but theorems do not have unique names. Um, and equally that sometimes one name will refer to different theorems. Properties often, even properties or uh, have different names. I mean, I remember seeing Latin squares and quasi groups are apparently the same thing. One Latin squares belong to combinatorics, quasi groups belong to algebra, but they are actually the same entities, which you no know, makes it hard to find things. So these are some of the tasks we need to do, and people are working on these. But I still think proving the obvious is the effort needed to prove obvious things is what is going to be the most frustrating to professional mathematicians. And that is why we have a wonderful thing called sorry, which means I'm not gonna prove this. I believe it, I'm really not gonna prove it. I'm gonna set it aside and prove the things that I'm really worried about. And that is the magic tool that makes this technology available to mathematicians today. Now, I'd like to mention my postdocs. Now, an awful lot of people, including in other communities, have been doing tremendous work, but I think I should mention the people who are working in my project here. Um, 
And of course, I should thank people who gave me so much money. And that is it from me. So I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Larry, for the inspiring mm -hmm. talk. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to give a hand of applause on behalf of everybody. Okay. And we're happy to take questions um, in the Q&A section. Uh, nice. So we, you can click on, at, at the bottom of the screen at the Q and A session uh, uh, section. I don't see any questions on the Q and A, but I see Anna has raised her hand. Oh, we have a. a, a let's see. How do I? How do we? Uh, let me let me try, Kira. Uh, Kira, I may need some help here to in, to enable somebody to speak if you uh let me uh click oh on right one. okay i got it yes uh anna please uh state your question so i think you can uh you are unmuted now okay hi larry this is Anna and warren we enjoy <laughs> enjoyed your uh presentation very much i see um we're in we're in texas right now uh -huh. um was curious you know the volume sort of you mentioned it a little bit in, in sort of how to find theorems and so forth, but I the amount of mathematics is truly immense. And I'm interested in this indexing question or how you find things. And the same problem exists in software. I mean, if you go on, you know, um, any of the the some of the code websites where there's previously proven code. I'm not previously proven, I'm sorry, uh, previously authored code that, you know, you might want to search for something because you don't want to rewrite whatever again. I'm just curious if you have, you know, any uh, thoughts or insights on how these concepts, you might be able to search for them using the kind of, I don't know, theories or whatever you have. You know, I, I, I might come up to you, I, I, I would think a practicing mathematician would come up and want to say, well, I'm interested in doing some math that involves this kind of mathematics, but, you know, has has these characteristics and so forth. Could you please show me what you have sort of? Uh, do you, have you, is your project given any thought to this problem? In my talk today, I was only talking about formalizing mathematics. However, oh, my thing disappeared. I wanted to mention um, Yanoth's Stasopoulos, who was one of my postdocs, uh, was basically working entirely on problems of that sort. And <clears throat> he made his search engine, which he calls Serapis, for searching um, the Isabel libraries. Uh, it, it, is, it is reasonable, but there are still a lot of really hard problems there, as, as I said, because concepts uh, there are many, many mathematical concepts, and they're not always that easily tied to a particular bit of formal syntax. Thank All right. You. Now, I see a huge number of questions. I see Freak. Are you pronounced Freak? Freak. How do I answer live? Uh Okay. Yeah, so that, that is a question in the Q&A. Uh, so I uh, clicked on it. Let's see what it does. So... Um, it's a good question. Could AI help prove the obvious? I'm honestly not sure. AI is very good at copying things that's seen before with modifications. Um, I think if someone wants to try that, they should do the experiment. Where we have found AI to be um, promising is in the field of auto-formalization, where there is a lot of pre-existing material. So if you have tons and tons of formal proofs, which we do, then something like GitHub Copilot can be helpful. But that is not about proving the obvious. OK. Uh, a lot of uh, questions are gathering. Let's let's now take another question uh, uh, from Simon. So uh, we had a hand raised. So Simon, please ask your question. Hi, Larry. Um, thanks very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, one one question that I had was about abstraction. 
you know, in computing, we think a lot about abstract, abstraction, abstract types. So we put up a barrier so you don't know how something is represented and we just program in terms of that barrier. And in, in maths, it seems, I mean, one of the things I remember learning very early on is that you move between different representations, say, of sets, either as a characteristic function or as a, an enumeration. And that's quite easy, but they're still set. Um, and, and in a sense, the representation isn't visible to the to the proof that you're trying to make. I mean, was that was that sort of question? Did that come up in the sorts of formalizations you were doing, and and how did you tackle it if it did? I think I would be more worried if I were using a dependent type theory because I think that when you have um, where definitional equality becomes important, it might be trickier to take different views of a thing. Um, I know what you're getting at, though I'm not sure. Well, there is one, in fact, it's actually going back to this Ramsey theory stuff that there are at least two different ways. They're not very different, but two different ways of characterizing a Ramsey number. One is in terms of graphs with the cliques and the anti-cliques. And the other is in terms of functions um, and what they call um, <clears throat> monochromatic partitions. I and mean, it is essentially the same thing, but it looks quite different. I and mean, it, is, it is analogous to characteristic functions versus sets. Um, and yeah, I uh, use either of them in this particular thing that I have been working on. You can use one or the other as you like it. All right. Thanks. So, so uh, let's make more progress through the Q&A list. Um, we have a, a question from Emil. Dijkstra and others popularized equational proofs. What roles do equational proofs play in your work? What is your experience? Um, I don't have a, I don't think much of Dijkstra's idea of equational proofs it, it seemed. It is certainly true that doing A equals B chains of that is in some cases quite convenient, but his attempt to do logic in that way was not successful in my opinion. Um, he could certainly, he was certainly correct to say that if you write out proofs in natural deduction, you will be writing for a very long time, but we don't do that. The computer is doing proofs, very close to proofs by natural induction. It's not writing them out. Um, and Dijkstra's style was never intended for automation. So we do use equations. Um, certainly you get uh, all kinds of mathematical identities like X plus Y equals Y plus X and so on. Um, and yes, uh, that kind of thing we can reason about automatically and quite efficiently, but it only doesn't go really much further than that. All right. Um, another question from Egan. So Egan, please ask your question. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, I have a remark to the quote from he from uh, Heiding, which I found interesting. Um, there is a very similar quote from Jan von Neumann on the on Hilbert's problem on Hilbert's project on Beweistheorie, and that paper was written before Turing and Church proved undecidability. And, and Jan von Neumann noticed. Let me read it from the decision problem book where I have put this note. Uh, von Neumann says, the undecidability is even conditione sine qua non for the contemporary practice of mathematics, using as it does heuristic methods to make any sense. The very day on which the undecidability would cease to exist, so would mathematics as we now understand it. It would be replaced by an absolutely mechanical prescription by means of which anyone could decide the probability or unprovability of any given sentence. So, so, so this idea of mathematics being something which is more than even one of many formal systems uh, is already there for hundred for, for of years. I, 
So that's yeah. what I wanted to, to clarify. So the yes. idea of fighting for intuitionism is very similar to what Jung von Neumann thought about what mathematics is. Well, they were probably around the same time as well. Uh, ah, the okay. 20th century. Yeah, good. Of course, yeah. it's amusing because Leibniz referred to the dream of being able to calculate all the answers. But as you say, such a calculating machine would kill mathematics as a creative subject. Uh, not entirely. As I like to stress, the genius of mathematics does not lie in the proofs so much as it lies in the definitions. So for example, Shemaradi's regularity lemma, when I look at the proof, I see some relatively straightforward things involving summations. But the question is where the hell or how the hell did he come up with the definitions which led to the proof? So even a calculating machine that proved all the theorems would not create the definitions which, which are the soul of the work. Yeah, okay. I, I forgot to say thank you for your talk. I found it, found it very interesting. All right. Uh, thank you. So back to the Q&A uh, list. Uh, Michael asks, is there any development to formalize results in reverse mathematics? For example, relationships between the big five subsystems of second order arithmetic? I'm afraid that it goes right over my head. Um, yeah, you're... Yeah, I, I, I only vaguely know what reverse mathematics even is. All right. A um, uh, question from Anonymous. Can we expand a bit on the difference between simple type theory and dependent type theory? That's a far reaching question. This is a, a very big subject. Um, typically, in dependent type theory, your types can take parameters and therefore you can express families of types very easily. As I alluded to in my slides, the families of types don't quite behave as you might wish because the definitional equality of the index becomes crucial. And that is um, not really a mathematical concept, if you ask me. Um, when we are working in simple type theory where we do not have families of types in that way, you typically would need to take a large enough type from which you can look at type sets within that um, and then create as your carriers of your groups or of your topological spaces or whatever needs a carrier. They would be subsets of this bigger type and you would create families of those sets instead. And of course you will have equality doing the right thing there because we're working in an extensional system. Okay, a question from Nikolai. Any major bugs found in math libraries? I guess in the math results that you have formalized, you, you touched upon a little bit in the, in the talk. Um, I, I mentioned errors found. We don't tend to find many errors. And I another point I like to make is that although we find errors in proofs, they are usually trivial and we almost never find claims that are flatly false. So even when the proof is incorrect, the claim is true. And that is a sign that mathematicians not really working with proofs in their heads. They, they know, they see what's true. Um, and that is, is astonishing. Okay, uh, just a quick follow up from Freik. His name is pronounced Freik, <laughs> the Dutch version of Frederick. So I, I want to say this, but I was afraid that I would mispronounce it myself, but now I did it. <laughs> um, now, Sergey asks an example of De Brown's note about using meta language. Example for, for it. Well, I thought I did already. Um, in the, the, I mean, I, what exactly what De Bruyne meant, I'm not sure, but I thought he meant that you could perceive the truth of something like the Ramsey number from the graph I gave is kind of obviously following. Mm -hmm. In fact, you'll find in many proofs, 
For example, if you look at a proof of Gödel's theorem where they give you the encoding of various syntactic operations, then you might say, wait, where is the proof that this encoding actually performs that syntactic operation? And it's omitted because it's obvious. And yet some of these proofs are not entirely trivial, yet they are obvious enough. I, I'm not sure that De Bruyne was referring to anything much more than that. Okay. Uh, just to say that if we don't manage to go through all the questions, uh, we will mm -hmm. collect all these questions and mm -hmm. uh, we can also uh, follow up with this. So one question is about uh, providing some references. Uh, I'm going to postpone this one. Um, I really, uh, Anonymous, Anonymous says, <laughs> I really enjoyed your talk. This may not be related to content, but as a teenager, okay, we have a question from a teenager. I want to ask what I should focus on as I study mathematics in the future to be a great mathematician. Okay, I have no idea. Yeah. I'm not a great mathematician myself, so how could I possibly answer that question? Or let's say to be to be a, a reliable mathematician, maybe we can slightly rephrase. Am I a mathematician? I suppose I have to count them. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> just enjoy yourself and find things to study and learn and be curious and all that. Okay. So uh, let's switch to a voice question. We have a question from Margaret. Margaret, please, you, you are unmuted. Um, okay, um, there, is a, there is a connection problem. Uh, Chiaran Dune, uh, Dune says, can you say something about homotopy type theory and its univalence axiom? Uh, is there any any relationship between uh, uh, what you formalized and and that, that particular formalism? I was merely happy to get funding when I did not say I was going to do that. Now, what's interesting is that in 2016, there seemed to be a widespread assumption that the HOTT approach was the only one. Um, no one is saying that anymore. It is very hard to predict the future because I think in 2016, also nobody would have predicted that zillions and zillions of things would be formalized in lean. It just happened like an explosion. And maybe HOTT will have its day, but we're waiting. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, this seems to be uh, at, at the end of, uh, of the list, we have a question about a bat. So uh, an anonymous uh, user has a, has a bat with a mathematician friend. Uh, before this de decade is out, a major unsolved problem in mathematics, uh, one from, from the clay list will be, for example, will be solved by an AI. So do you have a view on that? Uh, I doubt it very from... much. You, you doubt it very I much? I doubt it very much indeed. It may be solved with the help of AI to do stupid things. Um, but no, I don't expect it will do a big creative act. Okay. So um, we seem to have exhausted the list. Okay, we have another question from, from uh, Tadeus. Um, you use the phrase AC phobic, implying that criticism of excessive use of AC is a matter of personal phobias or ideologies. I, I can see, yes. But one doesn't need to be an ideological constructivist to acknowledge that hardwiring AC into the entire setup. Anyway, it is a, it is a long question. Yes, <laughs> I see the question here. We are not extracting computational content from proofs in this. We are proving things. The things we are proving are typically not constructive. And this is how mathematics is typically done. Uh, we're not talking about things that are computational in any way. But there are um, certain uh, branches of mathematics, for example, set theory with the axiom of determinacy in which at the axiom of choice is contradicted and there's other work where you might want to formally study equivalence of the axiom of choice. So unfortunately, that kind of thing cannot be done in Isabel Hall as it is currently set up. 
You could do it in the thing called Isabel ZF, but it doesn't have any of the automation that people like. So I, there aren't many takers for that. Okay, so uh, we are going to be heading towards the end. Let's take two more questions. Um, uh, Frank says, can you say something about uh, John Harrison's trick to use type variables as natural numbers to do something like dependent types? Did you need that a lot in the work you reported about? Isn't that an ugly hack? Um, John Harrison's trick. Um, it's really useful for certain things. So uh, I don't know how to explain this in a few words, but John Harrison found a way that you can refer to things like R of n, so the n-dimensional Euclidean space, with n being a kind of a variable without using dependent types. <clears throat> and it goes so far, but the problem is that it's absolutely not giving you a proper treatment of Rn, because eventually you're going to want n to vary in a non-trivial way, and then it becomes very difficult. I I mean, there's a lot of Isabel's analysis library is based on what I would call a simply type analysis. And <clears throat> it's unfortunately got severe limitations because uh, you cannot um, have families of things that you would like to have. And so we have to use different formalizations of things that are more general and are certainly not using John Harrison's trick there. So as soon as you're using a type as a carrier of anything, you are boxing yourself in and you're not going to be able to do the kind of constructions that people are doing all the time. So for example, for topological spaces, we have a general topological space construction that works for arbitrary carrier sets. And that is the kind of thing you would need to use. Okay, uh, and now uh, a final question by Sergey. Just to say that all, for all the other questions, we're going to forward them to, to, to Larry, all the questions that uh, 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 have not been answered. Does Isabel care for compiling algorithms to executable and for the performance of executable code? Yeah, I guess the answer is yes, but maybe you want to elaborate? Well, I'm not the really the, the person to answer this. So there is what we call code generation is a very simple concept that our language, which is higher order logic, has a fragment that resembles executable code and one can um, translate it into the corresponding executable code and run it. But I'm not sure, I think maybe in the future people are trying to put this on some kind of sound and meaningful basis, but I think at the moment it is based on an intuitive idea that a certain bit of logic corresponds to a certain bit of code. So there is a degree of trust involved at the moment. Now, I, I think this trust, the need for trust could be removed in the future. One could consider formalizing some kind of language within higher order logic in which you could then get a highly rigorous translation into executable code. Um, I should say that this is not like something like Martin Luth type theory, where a connection between executable code is actually part of the calculation itself. But typically then your code, although executable in theory, is not likely to terminate while you are still alive. Okay, so with your permission, Larry, I'm going to take two more questions, uh, 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 quick questions, because they are they are on topics that, that you have addressed, so maybe you want to bring some okay. of the points home. So Keith asks, have you found any problems where you depend on tiles who are useful? Um, in a sense, we couldn't because we're not, I at least, I'm not familiar enough. Now, it's funny, Anthony Borg, who is very familiar with both uh, homotopy type theory and Koch seemed quite happy showing that dependent types were in fact not necessary for things. Although at the same time, he did do a project in Lean just to show that he could. So he has a very flexible knowledge 
of all these systems, and that is a, a very good thing to have. Um, normally, I would think if one is getting stuck with a type, one has probably chosen the wrong formalization of the thing that you are getting stuck on. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, Charan asks, uh, can't you do such AC uh, uh, investigations using uh, ZFC in whole or some modification thereof? So I guess it's a question involving the sort of the large, larger well, resources. The ZF in Hall is a very useful thing, but it is embedded in the Hall framework in which the axiom of choice enters at a relatively early stage in the development. There was a time when Isabel Hall actually had an AC free part, um, and it, it kind of still exists, but there is none of the things that people really like are in there. Things like Sledgehammer are not available. So it becomes a non-starter. Okay, so I think we can uh, we can conclude the session here. Thank you very much, Larry, again thank for you. the great talk, and uh, thank you to the audience for for the very lively Q and A. And uh, uh, yeah, so I, I I should just say that we have uh, please check the FACS uh, and LMS websites for more great talks coming up. And again, this talk will be made available on YouTube for people who, who have missed it. All right. So um, thank you very much.